well, let me say what I'm going to talk about today. And um, I'm trying to uh, try to understand and try to explain to you uh, what about about our perception of science might be specifically the exact science might be a little bit different than I would like to do explain. So uh, I will argue that uh, we should have different kind of a perspective uh, when we think about pre-modern science, or even we don't even say science at some point, we say natural philosophy at that point. And uh, let me start from, okay. Uh, I think I should be able to move it along, right? Uh, I'm not sure I can, sorry. Oh yes, uh, now I can. Uh, so uh, one thing I should clarify in the beginning, uh, this is, an extremely uh, wide topic. So I, I won't be able to cover everything. And since we don't have a couple of years to discuss together, uh, only for 40 odd minutes or so, uh, I will unfortunately have to employ some generalizations, which I hate to do. But for this, I apologize in advance. And uh, we have to go through with this, including even this uh, description of science in modern times. And what I want to explain, uh, what we see as, as science today, and this is just one of the explanations of science uh, as we look at today in the modern times. But uh, the main thing is clear for everything that today what we do is uh, try to explain with science the questions what and how. And as much as possible, we leave the question and answer of the why to a, a different stage. Uh, the main reason for this, because we do believe that philosophy is no longer a part of the uh, historical studies, historical understanding, and we, there, there was a clear separation, apparently, in our mind or in reality, which will be discussed a little bit here. And we, we'll see about that, uh, what kind of a perception we should have or what we, what we were having already. And when we try to understand and limit, uh, limit any kind of information, what we use uh, is classification. When you start classification of things like science, uh, you start saying these are belong to this the topic, but there are other things that doesn't belong in this category, this classification, so you leave it out. And then you actually make it a little bit harder to understand, uh, not, sorry, uh, much more complex to understand by uh, using that same classification or a similar classifications uh, within specific branches of science. So you start doing that. And here, uh, we also have the idea of exact sciences, which is the main topic here. Uh, and when you look at this, specifically look at the first one is the physical sciences uh, about the astronomy, physics, chemistry, and earth sciences. You do not see mathematics there because uh, up to a point, uh, even today, m mostly actually, uh, mathematics were not uh, regarded as one part of a specific, uh, specific branches of science, but a tool for the science. Even now, uh, astronomy, physics, chemistry, or other science, we can't actually think uh, doing those sciences without mathematics. So we need mathematics to do that. Uh, uh, until perhaps Cantor's uh, set theory, we never assumed that mathematics becoming uh, an individual science anyway. And Perhaps that's one of the uh, that's one of the breaking points. At least that's what we think about that. So I will go uh, through this over time. But when we talk about exact sciences, we usually assume uh, because it's quantifiable, we use mathematical approach to any science, and then we can give an exactness of that one. Uh, the <clears throat> main idea here uh, is the classification, but the classification doesn't help enough because we see resemblance uh, on the earlier works. So what we, what we have the, the same classification in Aristotle, but we have the same classification in Islamic world, it could uh, lead to some sort of a, a questioning of the modern understanding of just because we classify that doesn't mean this is exact science and the modern, a pre-modern uh, idea may not be science. So that's the question I'm looking for. That's the question I'm trying to answer as much as possible if it's uh, at that point. And uh, <clears throat> we do, because we, we have a differentiation now, we, we actually have an understanding that philosophy is no longer part of the science. We make the ma main breaking point differentiation by saying before that this was a natural philosophy. 
it was correct at some point because even uh, Isaac Newton, when he writes about his works, he talks about natural philosophy and many people write about natural philosophy. So science as a word comes uh, later at some point in the, in the late 8th century, 18th century or 19th century. And then we see that classification is, uh, is affected by the idea of science or uh, even natural philosophy converting to the science as we understand today. So this kind of classifications will help us uh, to get better understanding, perhaps. Uh, it was important, and it is still important, but uh, interestingly, and uh, after the, uh, the second half of the 20th century, we do not see many classifications anymore. Uh, before that, we had philosopher professors, uh, philosopher mathematicians, philosopher chemists, uh, philosopher scientists, who both deal with sciences and at the same time try to come up with the main idea as the philosophical background of the sciences that they were dealing with. So they were continuously classifying because, uh, again, it, it is the most important thing what we do. Perhaps the knowledge actually requires uh, and it, it has to be uh, classified at some point to be able to give a meaning to something other than other things and differentiating an, an entity or a thing itself from the other things and the natural phenomena, everything requires some sort of a classification. So we have numerous classifications over the over hundreds of years. And uh, I would like to give a couple examples uh, going backwards in time a little bit uh, and see what kind of idea they were trying to go for. Uh, and I have to thank Rafael Sandoz, Dr. Rafael Sandoz for this because uh, he uh, is working on uh, the uh, historiology of the, and the atlas of the uh, classification of sciences throughout the history. What kind of uh, idea actually uh, in the divisions they were having by philosophers, by scientists. And uh, please do check out this website. I am, yes, they already put it on the chat. So uh, this is a, a fountain of information about uh, classification of sciences. You can come up with the, the main original ideas of the or philosophers themselves. As you can see here, the later, one of the latest classifications by Charles Sanders Peirce, uh, which is one of the, uh, one of the philosophers uh, who actually shaped the modern science at some point. And you can see, I will not go into too much of detail here, uh, just for you to see, I want to show it, how, how detailed it became over time. Uh, and this was less, uh, less complex at some point. And let's go to the Schopenhauer's idea in 19th century, for example. He uses pure sciences as, an, as a specific name, a term. And you, you see logic over there and mathematics over there, with geometry and uh, arithmetic and algebra and algebra. But at the same time, you also have mathematical sciences, we, too, we, call, we call today in the empirical sciences. So there is something, uh, it, there is some correlation between even with the divisions and you cover all the things when you classify. It, the sciences almost cover every kind of knowledge you can come up with, with reading, experimenting and talking and uh, making uh, any kind of calculations and measurements. It, as you can see, jurisprudence, psychology, history, ethics, everything is belong to the same category. We call it, apologies, we call it sciences. So another example will be here in the same, at the same time with uh, Schopenhauer is August Comte. And we see over there with th theoretical sciences and practical sciences uh, it has differentiation. But again, in the theoretical sciences, we have concrete mathematics and we have con uh, uh, abstract mathematics. So we have uh, uh, what we have here, I will uh, try to give the idea here, is not just classifying, but also uh, showing the interdisciplinarity of things as well, because it remains quite close to each other, even though you are actually making uh, distinctive defini definitions, it still gives you some sort of a a breaking point to come back to the main idea, which is the sciences coming from the same thing. So what does this give us? Uh, my main idea when I see this kind of classification specifically and where, why it stopped uh, having that, that kind of classifications and the, the first slide, uh, the, the main description and the uh, divisions of the sciences today uh, gives me the idea and there is, there is of course, there is a change, but the main, before the change, before the change in the 20th century, we have uh, cover, all covering sciences. 
uh, all, uh, all that's a science that answers all at some point. And every philosopher or scientist and philosopher scientists trying to come up with some main ideas uh, that will answer all the questions about a specific uh, generalization or uh, classification. And then you come into a specific branch of science. And in that science, all they try to give is exactly the same, same thing. Uh, if for, let's say, for uh, astronomy, what they try to give uh, an, uh, an idea uh, uh, and a set of axioms at, at that point that will answer all the questions. So uh, this is not too uh, new for me because the history of science is filled with this kind of an idea. But let's go uh, uh, to the mod 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 uh, conversion of the modernity of the science uh, examples uh, here. Uh, uh, Isaac Newton's approach, for example, uh, we have to go. He talks about natural, uh, natural philosophy, but uh, we do believe that he is actually one of the uh, fathers of the modern sciences because he's using elements uh, on the universe and the phenomena he is trying to explain is creating laws that we even use today at some point. And his idea about the universe, universal phenomena, his idea that creating a system that would work. So uh, the main thing is here, classification, all classification is creating systems. So, and uh, the same thing happens with Albert Einstein. Uh, he's trying to uh, create a, uh, some, some sort of a fixed leg of the, leg of the uh, compass. So you, when you can draw something, you will always have a baseline. So you can make all your definitions from a specific point of view. And this will give you the main idea that everything is connected to each other uh, uh, through that constant, which is the first, uh, his, his first trial was the cosmological constant. He abandoned in 1931. And then uh, he actually created another idea based on, of course, many of the uh, scientists' ideas. Uh, uh, and then we now have universal physical constant, which is the speed of light in vacuum. Uh, it may not be correct. Uh, we in in 50 years we we start to say it it was wrong perhaps, but idea was never wrong because Albert Einstein had the general idea of the same uh, same path Aristotle take or the scientists in the Islamic world took, and that is creating something uh, for everything. So uh, Albert Einstein believes that. Uh, Today, as we know, with the specifically, which I uh, with, with the quantum realm, quantum mechanics, we start seeing uh, that physical constant may not be correct or may not be uh, viable to use in the quantum mechanics. But uh, he says uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, uh, that's what he's th I'm thinking. Uh, it doesn't matter if speed of, uh, speed of light in vacuum is not your constant. You still have to create a constant or you have to find a constant that will work everywhere. That's the main idea Einstein tried to uh, follow up uh, for, for, the, for the rest of his life uh, until very late or uh, for a couple of years of his life, perhaps in the end. But uh, this was the main idea in the uh, even in the 20th century, including David Hilbert. Uh, when we started to uh, have uh, a pure mathematics uh, after Cantor's uh, uh, set theories and new ideas coming up. And what, now we have pure mathematics, which deals with mathematics for mathematics, not for as a tool for other branches of sciences, but uh, like almost like a philosophical discussion. And uh, this actually created new possibilities for many scientists in the 20th century, uh, late 19th century as well. And everyone was trying to come up with new ideas. And every idea would create some sort of an inconsistency with each other or, or with the, within the system itself. So David Hilbert was uh, proposed a system. Uh, it would fit all. Everything that would be worked on, specific all mathem mathematical calculations, would fit all the same set of uh, axioms that you use. And as long as you use this, it will remain consistent. That's what he was going for. So, so far, what we see here, uh, all inclusive ideas and consistency. Consistency, I will be using a lot, uh, I think, uh, throughout this uh, discussion. Uh, talk, let's say, not discussion, but uh, so uh, please be, uh, uh, be aware of that. And we see that uh, 
uh, all inclusiveness, uh, even though coming from uh, from the earlier stages, uh, was continued until twentieth century, and because of this, uh, we also have uh, still philosophical discussions, specifically not just uh, uh, philosophers but mathematicians and logicians, was trying to uh, argue uh, both against and opposing, uh, so uh, against and. Uh, uh, protecting the idea, trying to make it much better and much advanced, of course, with David Hilbert doesn't stay. But the, the question is, is it possible to be able to say that we could create a system that will never be broken? So that is one of the main problems. So is, is it possible that one day in history we will come to a level with an understanding that will cover all in mathematics, cover all in astrophysics, and then uh, no one with even with the new information will not be able to uh, argue that is not correct or inconsistent. This is where Kurt Gödel comes in, uh, a German Austrian logician, a philosopher, mathematician. Uh, even in he was uh, he was very young. Uh, he created uh, and uh, he published and proved uh, his incompleteness theorems, which had two main idea about this. And when he sees uh, systems acting like uh, uh, consistently with insight and covering all the problems, uh, he says, first, uh, it cannot be uh, complete because you will never be able to understand and never be able to prove that there was nothing, there is no single question that you will not be able to answer. It'll be impossible. So that means uh, you can't actually prove something impossible. That means your theory will remain incomplete. No matter how you try, it will remain incomplete. And the second thing is, even if you assume that you actually cover all the problems within that system and then call that system uh, completely consistent, is uh, logically impossible because it's just saying, uh, I created the system. How do you know it's true? Because I created it. It, 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 of, I know it's not that simple, but again, this is some sort of a generalization to finish up with my uh, work in the 40 minutes, sorry. So uh, here uh, he says, well, you have to be able to prove things not within the system itself, but out of the system. So you, you're using different axioms and parameters outside of that system to say that system is consistent within itself. It will never be able to prove everything covering all, and then uh, it will also never become completely consistent for everything. So it will be inconsistent uh, up to a level. So what can what can you do with sciences? So uh, because of the Gödel's proof, uh, so many people actually try to explain uh, how to approach to uh, to against uh, Gödel's arguments, or they try to prove Gödel's argument. They are still trying to prove some of his arguments. He actually created some sort of a mathematical equation. They're proving God, for example, and it's still uh, mathematicians and computer programming is trying to figure it out if this is really acceptable or not, uh, just to see uh, because he was trying to explain that you see. Uh, you can actually use mathematics to prove things that beyond uh, your imagination, not even actually your own knowledge scale. So uh, what you can come up with this idea is uh, you can create a system, classification of sciences or classification of knowledge might actually help you to create something. That system can cover a lot of things and it should cover as much as possible uh, or wide as possible things in your uh, area of uh, if it's mathematics, in mathematics, in astrophysics, in astrophysical laws, and you will be able to say, in as long as I can remain inside the system, these are correct explanations. These are truths. So it doesn't mean it will be exact in the sense that you understand that it will be exact for every time, no matter what. Uh, like uh, very old times, the ancient philosophers think that exactness is the exactness, so you can't actually change it because you can actually have some sort of a proof because m m a mind decides to that, and I'll come to that in a couple minutes. And uh, when you have a system, large system, as inclusive as possible, and if it's inside, you are consistent, then this is what we should call exact sciences. 
So that's not a problem. It's not it's not a mistake. It's not wrong thing to say this is exact sciences, because that means until there is a, there is a new system comes, this will remain the exact remain its exactness at some point. So when I come from this idea and uh, try to look back to history of science, I see similarities uh, every time I look at uh, even Aristotle, because. Uh, the main idea uh, of Aristotle is trying to create a system of uh, a system of rules, and those rules will remain in place until someone can prove otherwise. And uh, it, that's what we call Aristotelian physics. And most of the time, it was debatable at some point. Uh, in uh, it was debated extensively in the Islamic world and in Renaissance. Uh, but before that. Uh, when there was no actual system that would cover many things, uh, Aristotelian system was covering so many things at the same time, and it was working in many levels of understanding. People uh, couldn't be able to even actually uh, judge it, uh, how to pro appro approach to this one. And the main problem is, uh, if we come to the question of today's question of science, what and how, uh, in Aristotle, uh, these are the questions come later uh, than why, because Aristotle asked the question why he would have some sort of an idea and then put that idea. So the equation, so one side of the equation is already fixed in Aristotelian physics, and then you will come up with what and how with the descriptions, with the experimentation, with the observations to come up with new ideas. This became a problem in so many levels. And one of the most easy to explain problems uh, is in astronomy, because the, the uh, idea that the use of mathematics here in astronomy is the, the most extensive. And Ptolemy, the uh, best, uh, perhaps the most prolific Greek astronomer in the ancient times, uh, it created a system using Aristotelian physics, uh, that is, the Earth is at the center of the universe, fixed standing still and everything is revolving around Earth. And what he was trying to use, what he's trying to explain, uh, his geometry, his mathematics was not enough to give a, a, a perfect solution because we do know it's not true. So it is a, a, a geometrical a, a calculational nightmare uh, in a sense. So when he was trying to give an idea of that kind of a system, he knew it was wrong. He knew he couldn't manage it. But again, Aristotelian idea, if mathematics doesn't fit to the uh, explanations in the phenomena you see in the world, it is possible that what you see might be wrong. It, it might be actually a different way to see it. You just don't know it yet. So uh, he was just saying the saving the phenomena. That's the, that's his term. So he's trying to give a little bit of uh, uh, taking out of uh, equation uh, in a sense that uh, it may not be proving everything, but at least it works. It does work a little bit, and it was used for a very long time until uh, even after Copernicus, we, they still used even in Europe, so it is problematic. So this changed a little bit uh, when we come to the Islamic world, because the reception of scientific knowledge with the, the translation movement in the Islamic world uh, had uh, give them a, a something that Greeks didn't have, a combination of different kind of knowledge, the traditional scientific knowledges from Persians, Indians, and Greeks. And so they could create new ideas and they could actually compare the data they have. So uh, they start the thing, yes, Aristotle is the greatest of the philosophers, yes, uh, Ptolemy has one of the greatest of the astronomers, and Galenos was the greatest of the uh, physicians. We should follow them through, but there are some mistakes they are making, apparently. So they are trying to ask the questions. So they started doubting themselves. They started doubting the information they had, and doubt tradition actually come into place. So I will give a couple examples about that tradition, uh, starting with Ibn Zakaria Razi who lived in the uh, late 19th, uh, late 9th and uh, early 10th century. And he uh, was a great follower of Galenos, Galen, Galen, we say. So uh, he was uh, trying to follow up everything Galen did. 
but uh, when he's working with patients, when they try, when try to treat, treat them, uh, he sees some, uh, some sort of a problematic thing, a problematic approach, because he understands that uh, Garan sometimes actually uh, makes some mistakes, but it doesn't actually write down uh, or it doesn't give detail, or even though it gives the detail, it doesn't have enough uh, experience on the matter. You, you, he starts seeing that. And he, he starts seeing that, he, and he believes that I should not follow blindly. I should actually try my observations and repeatable, under, uh, repeatable experimentation to make a better assessment. So uh, he's trying to give the much better idea. He's trying to uh, put a system in place. And when he's trying to talk about systems uh, in pharmacology specifically and the chemistry, uh, we see extremely important point with Razi's doing, because uh, he's the first person to uh, systematically classify chemical substance and uh, the operations, because what he's trying to do is giving a, a clear definition that could be used by others as well uh, for any kind of a chemical, a chemical operation. So he's trying to define the main idea of what, what, what chemistry we, we see. So that's why I keep using chemistry in, instead of alchemy, because he doesn't believe in mysticism. He doesn't believe things change because of the mystic rules, mystic things. It changes because they have the ability to change if they do change. And he explains vividly, uh, so openly, saying you can actually make changes on the color of the things, not the uh, original substance itself, but it changes the color so it looks more shiny, it looks like gold, but he knows that it's not changing, for example. But he is learning over time. That's why he's making the classifications. He's trying to come up with an idea that could be used by others as well. So he's asking the question, what and how? Uh, he's also a philosopher, uh, and he's asking questions why, but in the Islamic world, uh, in opposed to Aristotelian idea, the question why, specifically for scientists, I should be uh, focusing on, especially for scientists, they ask the question why independently of the what and how. Because uh, first, you need to understand what it is. You need to define that. You define it, and then you actually go into how to explain how it works, how, how operations work, how uh, treatment works, how mathematics works. And then you can use those arguments. If you want to go into the philosophy, you can use those arguments to make your case in philosophy. So that was the main changes. That's why I'm using the term scientification of knowledge, which would happen in the Islamic world. And that's what they were trying to do. And when you do not have an already established system that could work for, for, uh, for exactness of things, don't you won't you do the same thing try to come up with new classifications new ideas new operations uh, so you have to do it uh, and imagine that today we, we we teach our children about the elements and explain them everything comes from those elements in na in nature and then uh, we say there is nothing else you can use uh, those elements are the base baseline for everything we actually see here and then we create 24 uh, elements in laboratories in different circumstances. So it is an open world, and that's what he was trying to do uh, to make, make sure that he can actually create some system and someone will actually follow up on that and prove the same thing he would. Similarly, in astronomy, Ibn al-Haytham did the same thing because when he sees, uh, he's an, he was an Aristotelian, so he believed in the system. Aristotle explained that uh, what we see, that the Earth is at the center of the universe, everything is revolving in circular motion. And then he sees Ptolemy's explanations and he knows that this is wrong because the main system here, what you have to do is first you explain that you believe in system, uh, you believe those are your axioms and then remain consistent. So uh, he says Ptolemy is not consistent. He's not saying, well, of course, he would say uh, Ptolemy, uh, Aristotle is always correct. But uh, if you want to change Aristotle's ideas, then I would accept it. But if you, as long as you say this is belong to the Aristotelian tradition, then you cannot make that kind of calculations and call this a scientific understanding. It's impossible. So you have to be consistent. 
That's what he was trying to do. And it opened the door for everyone in the astronomy department in the Islamic world. Uh, whoever deals with theoretical astronomy and cosmology was trying to answer uh, Ibn al-Haysam's questions. And uh, they were trying to come up with new models to explain uh, befitting uh, mathematical calculations and uh, uh, what you can see, what can, uh, what can observe in the universe as a phenomena. So uh, one actually managed to do that. Ibn Shatr in the 14th century in Damascus, he created a system that would put, put Earth is at the center both geometrically and uh, with the, uh, their Aristotelian idea. And you could actually make calculations and surprisingly, it would correctly show you the way. So that means if you can calculate with using Ibn Shatter's model, you could calculate where Venus will be. Uh, and this is another breaking point at the scientific understanding. Uh, so even we do know that's not true, that Earth is not the, at the center. How can you make a, a reasonable, usable mathematical formula, create a formula like this and use it? To, to see it is correctly uh, showing the path of the planets. So this is a debatable idea because what makes our, our idea is more concrete than this. I'm not saying we are not advanced anymore. We, we are m far more advanced than this, of course, but we need to understand as well how to approach to things when we look at the science in the Islamic world. And Ibn al-Haysam wasn't actually talking about just about uh, astronomy, he was, uh, a modern scientist in so many levels, in my in my, in my opinion, and he was he was working on creating a system. If you can, uh, giving uh, exact systematic observations and experimentation, and he documents his experimentation. He explains it in detail. He, you know, he says uh, this is done like that. So you need to uh, do the same thing. If you want to do the same thing, you can do it. And we, uh, we actually do try Ibn al-Haysam's works, and it works. Uh, well, it's not too complex of, of uh, you know, set of experimentation, but again, he is one of the first persons doing this experimentation to prove a set of rules that, it'll, that will be consistent with each other to give you some sort of a system of optics, for example. He does that because he needs to explain the rectilinearity of the light with simple, a, a simple explanation, simple experimentation. Uh, even uh, children wouldn't do that kind of small and simple explanations sometimes. And uh, what he was trying to base uh, is uh, this is a new system you can use. And you, he uses this argument first to explain the uh, sight. Uh, which is quite different, extremely different than Ptolemy's ideas or uh, even before earlier Euclid's ideas and based on some, some of them based on Aristotelian uh, physics. And he's challenging the, those ideas to give almost a clearly modern idea. So that's, what, uh, that's why it's important. And uh, those two examples are actually in person, but uh, we have so many astronomers working on mathematics and trying to become, uh, trying to create some sort of an exactness of what they were doing uh, before coming into the questions of why. He, they were trying to define things in mathematics and in, in astronomy, and then they were trying to give some sort of a, a major point of uh, fixed uh, a constant. And what they would do is they would use very large instruments uh, with, uh, they would conduct decades long, uh, uh, decades long systematic observations, and then they would come up with formulas that would explain uh, the positions of the planets so you can actually use it for a very long time. And uh, it works so well at some point. In the 15th century, uh, the astronomical tables of Ulu Bay in Samarkand was used by Newton himself at some point, in the, even in the uh, coming to the 18th century. This is quite uh, important to know that uh, maybe not entirety of the science are exact at the at level, but some of the things they were doing becoming exact. Well, I'm saying this because their main idea is broken, that Earth is at the center of the universe. But uh, when, it, when we come to the uh, time, knowledge of timekeeping, this is not even the case because 
And also timekeeping deals with uh, measuring the time by looking at stars and sun and measuring their altitude from the horizon and then says if uh, this uh, sun is actually at this altitude that means time is this sun will be setting at this time so, uh, ri rise two hours ago three hours ago so the main idea is using a, a perspective from the earth so when you are staying in earth sun rises from the east and sets from the uh, uh, at the uh, 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 at the west so He's using this, uh, uh, sorry, not he, but uh, timekeeping uses this argument. And I can use the same formula to create same ideas, and you can come up with same solutions. Of course, we have much more quality solutions now. We have nanoseconds or, or atomic uh, watches to be able to tell the time much better. But it is fundamentally the same thing. We just have much better calculating devices, much better instruments, but you can use the same argument and you can't actually call this doesn't actually work because there is no why here. There is no philosophical background here. This is pure mathematics again. To come up for the solution, I saw the conclusion, sorry. Uh, I, I could give so many examples, but I am trying to finish up in time and this example, uh, th these examples uh, will come up, will lead many questions. And again, apologies for the, some generalization, but there are debatable uh, areas in my talk and in my, in my argument. Yes, I know because this is an ongoing investigation in my, in my area as well. So uh, all, all the thing I am trying to explain here, that uh, first we know about the systems and that system, what we say is creating uh, almost all inclusive not let's say let's no more saying uh, all inclusive systems that like uh, david hilbert would say or albert einstein try to do uh, we, we have almost all inclusive systems that would cover many things and it is consistent inside so if they were doing very similar things with the things with the instruments they have with the knowledge they have imagine that they don't even have the mi microbes anymore they, they, at the time they didn't really know about the stars the, the position of stars only looked at by naked eye they didn't even have uh, astronomical devices that we have this today so what you do with the classification what you do with uh, your creating your system of course they will be flawed but the main idea will remain quite similar so uh, when i look at the science in the modern times we are not that far away uh, yes we are more advanced but not that far away so that's what i'm trying to explain if it's possible that you would see the same or you already see it anyway so uh, that would be wonderful to say and thank you for watching and uh, listening and um, back to you zilke please Thank you very much, Taha, for this truly intriguing talk. Lots You've given us lots to think about. Um, and um, I'm sure the audience uh, will have lots of questions, which we'll see in the chat in a moment. But let me just take the prerogative of the chair and say this is, this is complex, what you've been talking about. What did contemporaries think about? Was this much discussed at the time? Was there debate about is this right or is it wrong, what even Haitham was doing, for example? Well, there's a main problem here. I am discussing, I'm trying to learn about this and I'm trying to come up with ideas for a very long time, five, six years, very long time in my research area, perhaps. But uh, specifically, I mentioned beginning in the 20th century and early 21st century, we do not have any uh, actual continuous discussion about, uh, maybe not in the scientists level, discussion about uh, the classification of things anymore. So scientists are actually working on science now. They are not working on the philosophy of science too much. And philosophers today uh, barely know the science in, in the modern sense. So it becomes a problem. So when we try to see people working on uh, the modern science, we don't see it. So I am uh, suspecting there are so few people working on the science in the Islamic world uh, becoming science or not or being, or related to the modern science or not I have I, there are some people working on some debates of course but uh, unfortunately it's not too lively discussion at the moment okay um, and what about the past I mean contemporaries of, of Ibn Haytham um, the discussion at the time oh sorry apologies I, at the time uh, when I, you mean at the time of Ibn Haytham yeah. Well, uh, 
there are some, uh, you see, uh, the correspondence between uh, astronomers or philosophers of the time is quite limited uh, in the 11th century, but we do know uh, some astronomers and some thinkers, and some scholars uh, had the similar idea. I'm not sure if they actually had the, any kind of correspondence, but for Biruni, for example, had a similar idea when he's trying to come up with new theories uh, and using the old uh, ancient uh, knowledge, he, uh, he says you have to be careful and you have to be more uh, literal sense and scientific. You have to be a, to create something, a, a little bit of provable things. And, uh, but in entirety, the, I can't say Islamic world it was uh, fill, filled with astronomers and uh, you know, uh, physicians doing the same thing all, all the time. But for mathematics, I think it is the same for everyone because uh, they don't make that kind of a differentiation between philosophy and science as we did today, but their question comes later. Their question of philosophical question based on their scientific understanding anyway. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I answered the question. Sorry about that. Thank you. Uh, we've got a question here from, um, from Said asking, can we say that our science is up to today's knowledge? Today's science, well, uh, I think it is, uh, it is always like that. We have to keep updating ourselves, even uh, uh, because there are so many things to d uh, decide, so many things to uh, argue, but we do not argue because uh, it, looks, it looks like philosophical discussions. So uh, uh, today, for example, uh, I was planning to give an example about the universe. When we, when we talk about the mass in the universe, uh, we use uh, argument, uh, a, a debatable argument, in fact, uh, that almost n more than 90% of the mass of the universe is at either dark matter or dark energy. So uh, we do not know anything exactly so much. Uh, there are some people now debating, is it possible that there is no dark matter at all? So uh, can, can we say this is an updated version? It is a question we do not ask too much, uh, but yes, we are up to date, at, uh, to a up to a level. But then again, it can change any time. We have to be prepared to lose the say, do the main idea about the science and changing new, uh, creating new classifications all the time. That's I think I think I can say. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Stephen is following up by saying by not asking why, where pre-modern mathematical scientists seem to be lower in intellectual status than the philosophers who were addressing that question? Well, uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, less, uh, sorry, it seem to be lower in intellectual status. Well, maybe, but uh, philosophers always, uh, as, as a person who actually graduated from philosophy department, I actually have a little bit of philosophy in my background. And I know philosophers usually uh, assumes that they are the one who decides about what it is. So they always define things. That's why one of the reasons perhaps in the modern times we actually have a clear definition now. It's, it's, philosophy is not actually giving any answers to us by scientists. And uh, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, well, uh, well, I'm stuck. I, I have to. I have to think about that question. Sorry, sorry, Stephen. <laughs> I think that is legitimate. Uh, we've got uh, um, an almost double question here from Swellin. Uh, how would you assess the role of axiomatics in astronomy? Uh, should I continue with this or no? Sorry. Uh, I would uh, maybe ask uh, answer that question first. In the modern times, you mean? Uh, I would assume so. Well. Uh, I, well, I am one of the people who argue uh, there are so many things to debate about astronomy, but we don't have astronomy anymore. We, we have astrophysics now. So it, uh, even the, the science of astronomy changed a lot. And the astrophysics, based on parameters that were, were actually supposedly uh, almost exactly acceptable and provable things. But then again, with, even with the dark matter, uh, our arguments are based on the effects of what we see. And we see some things going on, some sort of a glimmer in the universe. And we assume that glimmer can be calculated. And we start making calculations. And yes, it would work. And then we say, oh, this is because of the, uh, literally because of the, uh, the dark matter or dark energy's influence on that, on that universe, for example, uh, so, uh, in the, in the galaxy, for example. But then again, 
uh, this is no different than uh, 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 the Aristotelian idea of all the, having the uh, main uh, acceptance in the beginning in the equation, then creating the equation later for just to prove that one. Uh, it's not too different to me. Okay. And the second part, thank you. The second part of the question: Do you have the feeling that the change of mathematical language, for example, for instance, Euclidean geometry to calculus, has an impact on the experimental part of it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, because uh, when when we have the calculus now, we, we have uh, the main discussion about the mathematics doesn't need to belong to any kind of branches of sciences, so it can prove itself now because uh, it is proof. Uh, from the you know the non-Euclidean geometries started to explain, but at the same time, uh, they started to uh, made less exact for 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 the history of science. If you look at that, because uh, before that, with the Euclidean argument, we don't we didn't even say this is Euclidean geometry. We said geometry believing the same thing that the Euclid says. But then we have non-Euclidean non-Euclidean geometries, and then we start saying, wait a minute. Uh, is it possible that there are other systems that we can actually prove that may not be coincide with the same thing that with the Euclid's arguments? So uh, it opened doors to a far more different levels. That's why I actually gave the example of Gödel because Gödel said, yes, you should continue trying to come up with new ideas, more comprehensive systems, because you will never have the one system for all like Euclid would have in the medieval times. And uh, a question from Enes here, is there a need for an idea of completeness in contemporary science? That's a big question. Yeah. I think uh, I am with Gödel at this point. Yes, we shouldn't. Yeah, we shouldn't have to have the completeness, but uh, the consistency is important within a system because your argument should remain intact as long as you are using a specific system. So if imagine that you die and you only leave your papers at your home, even you haven't published anything. Uh, in, in that case, someone can come and su see those systems, and uh, they can actually use the same argument. This is like that, you know, with, with, with uh, giving, trying to give some sort of an idea uh, that could be used by uh, anyone as long as you remain in the system. So I think the completeness is not required, but uh, consistency does uh, uh, have uh, a lot of importance in, in the modern time. Or even not modern times, every time you're talking about science, you should have consistency. So um, if I may take this into the museum sphere, where we're, of course, uh, virtually sitting, what does that mean for a history of science museum? How should we display and explain history of science? Ah, uh, that's a that's a that's a big question as well. By the way, I know what you're trying to do, <laughs> but but the main thing is uh, I am quite lucky about this. We should feel very lucky about the history of science museum as well because uh, our instruments actually is the basic example of the exactness of what we can have uh, for a specific time. We can show one instrument by looking at one instrument, examining an astrolabe. Uh, that you can show that the, uh, the mathematics of the time, uh, the, the limitations of the time, and uh, provable uh, abilities of the mathematicians of the time, or astronomers of the time. And you can actually come up with a, a chronological uh, change if it's, it's possible, or if there is no chronological change, if there, there is some uh, breaking points, you can come up with that idea. And the evolution of Astrolabs actually it gives this uh, idea very much because you have in the history of science museum one of the oldest uh, astrolabs in the world the hafif astrolab and you can see how primitive that astrolab and how mathematics is wobbly in that sense and then you also have uh, muhammad mahdi al yazdi's astrolabs in your collections so you can see how advanced it became so that kind of a, a change can actually show a little bit of uh, what we can do with scientific understanding and how it actually uh, put uh, more into it and becoming more uh, precise, let's say. So I'm sure everybody in the audience uh, would now love to see those objects, which of course is not possible at the moment whilst we're in lockdown, but I can assure everybody that our complete astrolabe collection in all details is on our website. So this development, which uh, you've just been describing, Tara, can be followed up also virtually. Uh, but the scientific scientification of knowledge that you described, 
Do you think it is possible to explain that as a concept in a museum? Hmm. Well, I have to think about that a lot <laughs> because uh, it, it is. It is hard to uh, show an imagination, uh, an idea, uh, even with using instruments. I think, uh, well, uh, apologies, I have to really think about this before answering it. <laughs> well, you do have to. I will keep in touch and give you my answer if I can come up with some. <laughs> well, for our Vision 2024, the ambitious strategy for our centenary, that is, of course, those are the questions we want to address. So you've got a bit of time to think about it. And okay. we hope that you're going to share your thoughts with us. Um, this is unfortunately all we have time for this evening. So thank you very much again for a um, truly thought-provoking talk. Um, thanks also to our audience for joining us again uh, tonight, today. Please join us again too um, soon is what I'm trying to say. We look forward to seeing you then. And in the meantime, if you would like to support the museum and all the exciting changes to the display with Taha's input, uh, then please look out for details in the chat to donate online. Uh, but for now, many thanks and please stay safe.